All righty. Sharing the screen. Ah. Okay. Is this all visible and, well, not right now. Hold on. <laughs> Just a moment. <laughs> Is this all visible and like large and great for everyone? Large yeah, and great. Is. Yeah. Okay, great. Sounds good. And I'm going to put you all down here. So if I stop in the middle, it's because I am letting someone in. Yeah, it should just pop up right yeah. on your in the middle of your screen, Erica. Okay, cool. Well, all righty. I guess we will get started. It's what, seven, yeah, 706. We're good. Well, cool. Thank you all for coming. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to mention this before we kick off because I forgot last time. Um, so if you want to be added to, so this class is run by, or sponsored by, I don't know the right word, by PeaceWorks. And I forgot to mention last time, I usually put my, um, my email in the chat so that you all can email me um, if you wanna be added to the PeaceWorks newsletter. And so that newsletter goes out about twice a month and it just has things like events um, where we stand on issues, um, other news, I guess, that we might have to share. And so I will, <laughs> I'm trying to find the chat here. Okay, here we go. And I will put my email in there um, and just feel free to reach out to me. Um, if you, and if you feel comfortable, you can put your email in there too, and I'll save the chat and add you to that newsletter list. But either one, I just realized that this Zoom thing is on this share screen. Just a moment. <laughs> can you guys see the, my, the, my Zoom thing on the actual screen? No? Okay, sweet. Mm. We're good to go then. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Sorry. I swear I'm a millennial. Okay. All righty. So for those of you who weren't here last week, I just kind of wanted to give a quick summary. Um, basically what we talked about was why shifting to renewable energy was necessary in order to maintain life as we know it basically. Um, and we also focused on the need for systemic change. Uh, individual sustainability practices do make a difference. Like using a reusable coffee cup or not using plastic bags at the grocery store. That does really make a difference, especially if we all do it collectively. Um, however, the greatest change will be found in implementing policies and incentives and infrastructure changes that promote a greener future that we need to survive. Um, and then we also kind of uh, broke down the Green New Deal and just kind of talked about what it is. Um, so basically, it's a congressional resolution that's aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions in order to avoid the worst consequences of climate change, while also addressing the economic inequalities and racial injustices that exist in our society. Um, you want to go to the next slide, Erica? Yeah. So the Green New Deal is kind of divided into two parts. There's the green part and then the New Deal part. Um, so the first part is what talks about reaching zero greenhouse gas emissions um, and completely phasing out of fossil fuel reliance. And then the second part or the New Deal part talks about the social implications of that and how we're going to protect the people and their prosperity during that transition. Next slide. Awesome. Um, so someone, I think it was Mark, mentioned last week that the Green New Deal is um, very intersectional, which is a really important thing to mention. And like uh, Nikki just said, it's there's the green part and then there's the New Deal part, which is what makes it so intersectional. And so it's not just creating a greener America, which is a big part of it, but um, that's definitely a just, it, just it, a small part of it. And so it's about adding jobs and jobs with justice and integrity, especially, and building an economy and a society that we can be proud of. And so the Green New Deal includes a lot of green initiatives, but includes things like stopping the transfer of jobs and pollution overseas. Um, it includes workers' rights, more high-speed rails, um, some of which already exist, but um, in the world and, and whatnot. And uh, and the growth of domestic manufacturing and cleaning up existing hazardous waste and abandoned hazardous waste sites. Uh, 
And so it also includes the need for clean air, water, and healthy food, which seem like pretty basic rights. Um, and the Green New Deal addresses the wage stagnation and the anti-labor policies um, that we definitely need to reverse those trends that have um, kind of been going in a in a more, uh, not necessarily conservative, but in, in a, in a uh, it's been trending backwards a little bit for folks, for working people. Um, and so it mentioned clean and more importantly, affordable access to public transit, um, closing the ever increasing wealth gap, supporting local and family farming over factory farms, which is uh, really important here in places like Missouri, where CAFOs are getting more and more, um, uh, more and more rights and family farming is becoming harder and harder for people here. And providing every person with adequate health care, which, um, again, I mean, it's heavily politicized, but which everyone should essentially have a right to. I mean, you shouldn't have to have a degree or a specific schooling or um, or a specific job to qualify for affordable health care. Um, essentially, just you shouldn't have a certain job uh, that defines whether or not you're worthy of getting treated for an illness or whatnot. Okay, and so then the green part of the Green New Deal highlights this uh, especially. So 100% clean, renewable, zero emissions energy by 2035. And of course, 2035 isn't just like the date when the world ends, um, but it's the date that we have to make some significant changes by before we see our planet change um, irreparably in the future. And so again, we talked about this a little last time, but um, the Green New Deal highlights the most efficient and cheap um, forms of renewable energy, which is wind and solar. And um, there are other types of renewable energy like we talked about last time, like hydrothermal, <clears throat> excuse me, tidal um, and geothermal energy. Tidal energy is a bit expensive and we don't have like storage for it yet. And there are a few other reasons why that's not super prominent. Um, and then we'll also talk about here in a second why nuclear isn't a great option um, going forward. Boo. And so, um, so nuclear waste uh, is one of, there are a lot of reasons why it might not be a great decision, but so I'll go into each of these a little bit. So first nuclear waste, um, the waste is generated by nuclear reactors um, and it remains radioactive for tens of hundreds um, of thousands of years after it is created. And so currently there are no long-term storage solutions for radioactive waste. And most is stored in temporary um, above ground facilities. And they, we had, like we talked about um, in the previous class that PeaceWorks held on climate change, a lot of these nuclear waste sites are vulnerable to things like um, flooding and intense climate change events that just cause this nuclear waste then to spread in the communities around them. Um, the second thing is nuclear prol proliferation. And so there's a great concern that the development of nuclear energy programs increase the likelihood of pro proliferation of nuclear weapons. And so um, basically to avoid um, weapons pro proliferation, it is important that countries with high levels of corruption and instability be discouraged from creating nuclear programs. And so the US should be more of a leader in non-proliferation rather than pushing for nuclear more nuclear power here. Um, and similarly with national security, uh, nuclear power plants are a potential target uh, for terrorist operations and an attack could cause major explosions and put a lot of people at risk, not just, um, not just from that nuclear uh, or radioactive material, but also just the surrounding areas and regions as well. Um, and accidents, I mean, we've heard about accidents in the past, like uh, Fukushima and uh, Chernobyl, and just in both disasters, hundreds of thousands of people were relocated, millions, um, there were millions of dollars spent, and um, there were a lot of radiation related deaths and that are still being evaluated today. So those, those, um, uh, those, uh, the, the results of those accidents have lasted a long time. Um, and to go along with that one, there's also a hefty cancer risk with nuclear um, nuclear power and waste, and especially for childhood cancers like leukemia. Um, and then the energy production of uh, nuclear, nuclear power. So there are 444 nuclear power plants currently in existence, and they provide about 11% of the world's energies. And so studies show that in order to meet the current and future energy needs, the nuclear sector would have to scale up to over 14,000 plants. Sorry, my cat. Um, 
uh, and uranium, the fuel for nuclear reactors, is energy intensive to mine and deposits discovered in the future are likely to be harder to get to as well. And as a result, much of the net energy created would be offset by the energy input required to build and decommission plants and to mine and process uranium ore. Um, and so like related to that last one of energy production, there just wouldn't be enough sites to be able to build nuclear plants. Um, it's simply due to the limitation of feasible sites. So nuclear plants need to be located near a source of water for cooling, but um, there aren't enough locations in the world that aren't safe from things like droughts or flooding or hurricanes or earthquakes, like I mentioned before um, with the whole accidents and nuclear waste topic. Um, and then the biggest, or one of the biggest things, which is those next two, which are cost and competition with renewables. So unlike renewables, which are now the cheapest energy sources, nuclear costs are on the rise. And so the price of renewable energy has fallen significant over, significantly over the past decade, and it's, con, it's projected to continue to fall, whereas nuclear energy, um, many plants are being shut down or in danger of being shut down for economic reasons. <laughs> And uh, the competition with renewables is the, the big thing on here. So every dollar that goes to nuclear energy is a dollar that could have gone to renewable energy. And so um, financing for renewable energy is already scarce and increasing nuclear capacity will only add to that competition for funding. And then finally, um, this one's... Uh, uh, the last one on nuclear energy is just uh, the energy dependence of poor countries. So if we go down that, the nuclear power route would mean that poorer countries that don't have the financial resources to invest and develop nuclear power, which is expensive, like we talked about, would um, become reliant on rich techno uh, technologically advanced nations. And so the U.S., again, should kind of be a leader in, in, um, in encouraging countries to invest in, in safer energy technology. Okay, so what are the Green New Deal policies? And so uh, this is part of kind of the, the, the New Deal part of the Green New Deal, which, um, and so the first part is infrastructure renewal. And so we, we would like to see job creating opportunities to repair, upgrade, um, and expand neglected roads, bridges, and uh, the energy grid and water systems. And the energy grid part of that is really important because as we increase um, the use of renewable energy, I mean, that's a, that'll be definitely something new for us. And not only the energy grid, but also storage is something we could, we'd have to put, um, put resources in for infrastructure renew renewal and just um, and, and research. And so here's just an example of things that need to be repaired. So 46,000 of, of bridges are structurally deficient and in poor condition, and they are crossed 178 million times a day, which is terrifying. Um, and an additional 81,000 should be replaced on top of that 46,000. And so to go along with infrastructure renewal, so I talked about um, a couple of slides back the, to expand access to light rail and low emissions public transit, which again already exists in some places. So this picture here is of, um, I believe, a, a, um, light rail in Seattle. Uh, and a lot of cities, which um, Nikki will talk about later, have been moving um, to low emissions public transit. I think Columbia is as well, but we don't use our buses that much anyway. Um, and so things like replacing lead pipes and building a smart grid for increased wind and solar power, like I talked about before, having that, um, that new grid and storage system set up to be able to um, handle the capabilities of larger wind and solar energies. And replacing stormwater systems to prevent flooding and toxic runoff. And then restoring wetlands and other natural buffers that protect our communities, so places like the Everglades in Florida. And then weatherizing America. So with, uh, each time a homeowner, business, or local government weatherizes a building, which is just essentially like adding insulation or adding updated windows, um, things that just uh, allow your house to be able to use less energy. So that supports jobs, it slashes energy bills, and it cuts on climate pollution. So it's just kind of a win for everyone. And it also in the process creates, uh, like I said, hundreds of thousands of retrofitting jobs, um, saves families billions of dollars, and it just gets us way closer to climate sanity. Also, uh, I looked up what a snout house is. It's a house that has where a garage is the front facing, is, is facing the street. Learn something new every day about architecture. Um, and to go along with weatherizing America, so we could achieve these goals by 
um, developing new national energy efficiency standards for public and private buildings. And so the public invests uh, investments to help uh, energy utilities implement those standards. So instead of investing in things like coal and oil, invest in helping utilities implement and meet these new standards. And so building weatherization projects enabled by this funding should have, that's a huge part of the New Deal part of this, um, should have prevailing wages and focus on training opportunities in working class communities. So that's the big equity part that we talked about last week and that Nikki brought up again, um, again this week. And so the last one on weatherizing America. And so new national standards for energy efficient appliances and industrial processes would create more high road jobs in manufacturing and engineering, which again, creates this kind of win-win-win circle of cutting energy costs, uh, toxic emissions and climate pollutions. And so a high road job, um, I didn't really know this term until I read the Green New Deal um, and started learning about it. And so a high road job and a high road economy supports businesses that compete on the basis of the quality of their products and services by investing in their workforces first and foremost. And so these businesses pay the wages and the benefits necessary to attract and retain skilled workers who, who turn in turn perform um, high quality work. So essentially paying your workers livable wages or, or above livable wages and benefits um, to retain them and to, then they in turn uh, perform high quality work. All right, and so another aspect of the Green New Deal is buying clean, which kind of ties into what Erica just talked about. Um, basically, the goal and the purpose of this aspect of the Green New Deal is to make spending decisions be conscious decisions. Um, so each year, the federal government spends billions of our tax dollars to buy goods, like, for example, steel for bridges or paper for offices. Um, and the buy clean policy would ensure that the these government purchases help fuel the transition to a clean economy. Um, and it also helps with the creation of good jobs for those who need them the most. Um, next slide. Thank you. Um, so the way we can make that happen is we can require that tax dollars be spent on goods that are manufactured with clean and efficient practices to help promote um, our air, water and climate protection also requiring government contractors to pay family sustaining wages and hire and train local workers, as well as locating job opportunities in the working class communities and frontline communities as well. Next slide. So in order to see these large scale changes, we need to um, adequately address the climate crisis. Uh, we have to hold the fossil fuel industry accountable. So the Green New Deal calls for a whole rethinking of society and part of that needs to be corporate accountability. Um, so for example, Exxon Mobil, we kind of went over this in the video that was played last week, if you were here, um, but they basically created and funded an operation seeking to undermine scientific consensus that climate change exists and it's caused by the burning of fossil fuels. Um, and uh, Re the causes of climate change were researched and the dangers of climate disruption were found um, as early as the 1970s, um, which is pretty outstanding if you ask me. Um, and actually the former uh, ExxonMobil CEO uh, blatantly stated that we choose to not lose money on purpose, which just seems kind of silly in my mind because ultimately saving money doesn't matter if we don't have a planet that's habitable. Um, but anyway, so basically no one large corporations and industries in particular should be able to buy political influence for their own financial benefit. And the Green New Deal kind of highlights that. Next slide. So another aspect of the Green New Deal that Erica touched on was transportation. Uh, so the Green New Deal explicitly cites the need for overhauling transportation systems in the US to remove pollution and greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector as much as technologically feasible. Currently, uh, transportation accounts for 29% of domestic emissions. And then um, Eric and I are in Columbia, Missouri. So personally here, it accounts for 27% of our emissions. So we're definitely not any better than the national average. Um, and so to move away from, we, we want people to move away from non-essential individual means of transport 
So basically what that means is we want to save American families money by investing in clean uh, public transportation, also increasing the accessibility of electric vehicles for all people and adopting a complete streets policy, which I will explain more on the next slide. So this is an example of a complete streets design. Um, as you can see, there are lanes for uh, lanes and a road for cars. And then there's a clear separation between the road and bike paths and a sidewalk, which contributes to safety for bikers and walkers. And it also creates a clear um, accessible place for public transit users. Um, and I think this is important for cities to adopt because enforcing everyone to use electric vehicles isn't really achievable um, as we would like it to be. Um, that's just the fact of the matter right now. Um, and so we can kind of counteract that by encouraging people to utilize other greener alternatives to transportation, such as walking and biking. Um, but in order to do that, we need to make those alternatives safe and accessible for all people. Next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so that was kind of a quick summary of the different policies that the Green New Deal outlines. Um, so now we're going to get more into whether or not it's actually achievable. Um, so first we'll talk about a just transition for workers. So I know the fossil fuel industry has a bad rap um, and there's reasons for that, but we also want to recognize that the coal miners and the oil rig operators working in this industry aren't the problem. Um, and even if we want to leave fossil fuels behind, we can't neglect its workers as we shift towards a greener economy. So in order to allow that to happen, we need their standards of living to be protected and improved um, by guaranteeing their income, training, and pensions and relocation support for those affected workers and targeting um, investments in fossil fuel dependent communities. Next slide. So more on that um, with addressing job loss. I know that's a big topic that comes up when talking about transitioning to renewable energy. Um, research has shown that 83% of jobs that are expected to be lost can be accounted for through attrition by retirement, which I learned recently um, is a reduction of the workforce via retirement because most of the fossil fuel industry is approaching retirement age of 65. Um, and so the attrition part is just um, having those spots be emptied through retirement and then just not planning to replace those jobs. Um, and that kind of emphasizes the importance of making sure their pension plans are protected. And then the remaining 17% can be addressed through reemployment guarantees in clean energy industries. Um, and again, that's backed by research, um, but that kind of addresses the job loss that we would experience in this transition to a greener economy. Next slide. And then also with that just transition, we wanna focus on frontline communities. The fact of the matter is that climate change doesn't affect us all equally. I kind of touched on this a bit last week, um, but you know, a robust amount of evidence suggests that marginalized communities experience the worst impacts of climate destruction and pollution, despite the fact that they're typically the ones that contribute the least to the problem. So just to give some examples, there are 73 waste burning incinerators in the US and 58 of them or 80% are located within three miles of low income and minority neighborhoods which cause disproportionate exposure to mercury, lead and soot. Um, also communities of color deal with 56 to 63% of more air pollution than they create. Um, and uh, additionally, tribal lands occupy approximately 4% of the U.S. land base, yet 25 of Superfund hazardous waste sites are on native land. Um, and Superfund waste sites are the waste sites that require long-term response in order to clean up those contaminants. Um, so basically, the Green New Deal presents an opportunity to tackle that environmental oppression and inequality and inequity in those disproportionate impacts on the um, disproportionate impacts of the environmental damage on low income communities, um, communities of color, indigenous peoples and rural, rural America, excuse me. Alrighty, um, so now I'll talk about kind of 
uh, just to piggyback off of like, is it actually achievable and how we can pay for something like a Green New Deal. Um, and the first way is making fossil fuel, the, making the fossil fuel industry pay for their pollution. And you can do this through litigation or fees or taxes, and most importantly, eliminating federal fossil fuel subsidies. And so the federal government hands out almost $15 billion in subsidies to fossil fuel in, the fossil fuel industry every single year. Um, and so kind of not making the American people on the hook for this wasteful and dangerous spending um, and, and to pressure a, a big thing that, um, so climate leaders as, at Mizzou are CLAM as they're also known. Um, they're very, um, a huge proponents of divesting in in fossil fuel companies and so that's another way that we can um we can make the fossil fuel industry pay for their pollution is to pressure financial in institutions universities like the university of missouri um, insurance corporations and large institution institutional investors um, still invested in or insuring fossil fuels to tra transition those investments to clean energy bonds And so then reduce the need for federal and state sa safety net spending due to the creation of millions of good paying unionized jobs that, like I said before, have are, are not just paying a living wage, but like a prosperous wage um, and and benefits. And so safety net spending is also just um, are on things like such as welfare or, or food stamps. And so you'll have to be paying less of those because more people will have jobs that they can live off of. And so um, so. <laughs> Taxing the wealthy is always like a, a slippery slope um, of an argument just because it has the potential to make some people angry. Um, and so making the, I put in extremely wealthy and large corporations pay their, fa pay their fair share of taxes. And so um, I'm kind of defining extremely wealthy as like people who make I don't, like tens of millions of dollars every year, like, like $40 million a year or something like that, which is 0.1% of people in the United States would be getting taxed, um, fairly and more. Um, and so, and, and kind of running a country that isn't, uh, is, that is based on money is not a democratic, um, way to run a country and, and having lobbyists and, that say work for fossil fuel companies, kind of paying off politicians to then um, support those fossil fuel companies is not a way to run a country. And so making those corporations and the extremely wealthy pay their fair share to go towards um, programs that will help everyone in the United States. And so generating the revenue from so I had to <laughs> research this one a lot. Nikki and I talked about how we are not great with economics and what and 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 we talked about this. Um, I can't remember if we talked about it last week, but we definitely talked about it in the climate change class earlier uh, this year. That um, that the that the um, my, the the energy. Uh, sector is confusing on purpose for people to understand so that they can't like understand that oh wait the way they're doing this isn't right or the way they're doing this isn't fair and so it's confusing kind of on purpose and so this is essentially saying so generating revenue from the wholesale of energy produced by the regional power marketing authorities and so um this is basically saying that these would be community-run renewable power utilities and so instead of continuing to consolidate wealth among high paid CEOs of energy companies and shareholders, um, community utilities could reinvest wealth back into the grid and the larger community that it supports. Um, and so the funds could be used by the community utilities to invest in like a vibrant local economy and they would work with community members and the utilities could build or spur projects in energy efficiency, grid resiliency or shared solar and electrification and provide affordable, affordable energy rates, um, good jobs and access to community-based enterprise along the way. Um, and so I just wanted to jump on a bit of a soapbox about this because the more I read this one article about it, the angrier I got. And um, so utility monopoly, uh, monopolies often hurt low income folks um, over their shareholders and their high energy users. So high energy users would be people, I don't know who like, uh, water their lawns and keep their lights on constantly and don't really um, don't really pay, pay attention to their energy use. And a low energy user would be someone who um, potentially is low income and, and um, intentionally uses not a lot of water and not a lot of electricity. And so um, 
So high energy commercial users get lower rates while ordinary consumers who seek to save money through conserving energy or like installing solar panels um, find themselves being hit with higher fixed rates from utilities uh, just to get access to that energy. And so, uh, and, and that's been kind of on um, in discussion in Colombia that Columbia Water and Light is trying to charge um, low income or not necessarily low income communities, but people who um, who don't use as much energy more than people who uh, than, than people who use a lot of energy or like commercial users. And so there's this really great example, I believe it was in Ohio, and um, it's called DTE Energy is the company and um, it's an investor owned utility. They have a long history of pri prioritizing money making over the needs of the communities or the environment. Um, and so what they did is they essentially are, they're, they're a, a monopoly, DET, DTE energy is a monopoly, which we've also found is that a lot of energy utilities, um, there are like monopolies around the US of this industry. And uh, and so they, in this, in Highland Park, they repos repossessed a thousand street lights because of the $4 million in unpaid electric bills accumulated over the years. And so to put that $4 million unpaid electric bill into context, the DTE CEO made um, almost 200 million more than that. Uh, he made almost $6 million that year. And so the re that repossession prompted Highland Park residents to organize and to put up their own solar street lights instead. And so it forced the community to reckon with these deeper questions of how how this energy company um, treated residents. And so, uh, so yeah, so Highland Park just essentially created this little nonprofit group and uh, found cl that close to half of those polled had trouble paying their electrical bills. And instead of um, and, and a quarter had experienced gas or electricity shutoffs, the majority of which were during Michigan's, oh, sorry, it was Michigan, not Ohio, uh, Michigan's cold winter months, which is just dangerous and inhumane at, at, its, at the least. And, um, and so DTE has proposed an additional extensive rate hikes, uh, raising money that goes in large part to maintain their current coal plants um, and build new fossil fuel plants and to pay their CEOs. And so in the Green New Deal, having a community run, um, a con community run renewable power utility would, would prevent all of this. It would prevent just to, um, a money making utility and instead ensure that everyone has access to say like a warm place to sleep at night and, and water and those basic rights. Okay, I'm jumping off of the soapbox now. Um, and so, and then this last one is, uh, or not last one, second to last one is collecting new income tax revenue from the 20 million or so new jobs um, created by the plan. So the more jobs we create, the more in income taxes we can create to, to pay for um, certain programs that would benefit everyone in the U.S. And so this last one, um, which we'll, we will cover a little bit more extensively. So scaling back uh, military spending on maintaining global oil dependence. And so here you can see in this graph, so the US is in the blue here. And then you can see that the US spends more on military than the next 10 or so countries combined. And so the Green New Deal, and Mark talked about this a little bit last time, um, but it, it, it is a big way that we could fund the Green New Deal is to kind of fight U U.S. militarism and these endless wars that we seem to be getting ourselves into. And I just wanted to make the point that um, when we talk about this, it's not to say that I or people who don't support a war economy don't support people serving in the military or veterans or something like that. It's quite the uh, quite the opposite. And um and we'll talk about how most of our military spending doesn't necessarily go to folks that fight every day, um, whether they are here in or, or in other countries. And so um, ending these endless wars in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, Syria, um, and the carbon footprint of these military bases are enormous, especially internationally. Um, and so U.S. armed services consume more oil every day than the country of Sweden. And... Um, and the Pentagon is responsible for 141 Superfund sites. So Nikki talked about what a Superfund site was earlier. And so 54 cents of every discretionary federal dollar goes to the military. And, um, and so Nikki talked about attrition rather than layoffs before. So attrition, just letting people retire and not necessarily replacing them. So not laying people off from the military, but um, 
but again, just kind of letting people retire and not replacing that specific position. And so it was found that 1% of 2019's $716 billion military budget is enough. To, so 1% of that $716 billion um, is enough to fund over 120,000 green infrastructure jobs. And, and like I was saying uh, previously, that most of the military budget goes uh, to military contractors and not military families. There are a lot of statistics that say that a lot of military families are on um, are on, let's say, like food stamps and don't make enough money to necessarily live a, a prosperous life. And so um, I just really liked this quote by um, Dwight D. Eisenhower, and I'll just read the first, uh, the first sentence, which I think pretty much says it all. So every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed and those who are cold and not clothed. And so that's kind of what the Green New Deal uh, or a uh, uh, part of it tries to address is, is maybe taking money away from um, that war economy that we've kind of created and instead putting it back to the people who are, it, who are here in the US who are suffering. And so that leads us kind of to this peace economy um, this peace economy theory of, of, of prioritizing people, peace, and the planet. And so it prioritizes investment in social capital and human capital and to build capital and the natural environment. And it embraces um, economic conversion, which means that, which means that beating swords into plowshares and creating a peaceful uh, life affirming future for all people. And the peace economy is inclusive and it works for all of us. And it also addresses real security needs, especially um, through not exclusively the climate crisis. And, uh, and, and this can't just happen on its own accord. It takes everything we just talked about and more to accomplish it. And it's, it's of course going to be different and hard and it'll, it'll take time, but it'll be worth it in the future. And like we talked about last time, um, I think Mark mentioned it, that we can't just leave it to, to younger people. Although as inspiring as they are, we can't just leave it to them to fix it because um, it'll be too late. And so we need to address it now and to, to kind of push people who are already in office or soon to be in office to, to um, kind of embrace these ideas. And so I just wanted to touch on uh, political support really quick. Um, and so in this article I read, um, so in December of 2018, 81% of registered voters, including 64% of all Republicans were in favor of a Green New Deal. And this was according to researchers at uh, the Yale Program on Climate Communication. But by April, 2019, support among Republicans had dropped to 20% and it fell even more among people who considered themselves uh, conservative. And so it was found that um, misinformation through like Fox News and conservative and fossil fuel industry funded think tanks, which we also talked about last week and today, excuse me, um, claimed that the Green New Deal would trigger this economic devastation, even though the details of the plan had yet to be even um, to be released or fleshed out. And so they kind of didn't even give it a chance before um, the misinformation spiraled. And misinformation can come from either side of the political spectrum or from, from anyone. But in this case, um, it's kind of hold, holding us back from a really positive, um, positive future. All right. Now, I know we just gave a lot of information. So I want us all to take a deep breath. Let's process all of that. Um, so to get more into the achievability of the Green New Deal, I wanted to briefly highlight some places where Green New Deal policies are already being implemented and practiced. Um, so for example, the state of Illinois enacted the Future Energy Jobs Act, which gives low income families priority access to solar panels and it provides solar installation, installation job training. Um, and actually much of this job training to get this done is being provided to people who were previously incarcerated and to other communities that are fighting environmental injustice. Um, so that kind of touches on that just transition for workers and touching on environmental justice. And then California has a 100% clean energy um, promise by 2045 and they also have the buy clean policy enacted so that requires like we like i mentioned earlier that tax dollars be spent on goods that are manufactured under conditions that protect our environment so for example when state governments buy steel for bridges or companies buy glass for office windows it's it's 
sends tax dollars to manufacturers that are significantly decreasing their climate pollution and carbon footprint and offering livable wages to its workers. And then New Mexico also pledged to be carbon free um, with their electricity by 2045. And I just noticed that's a dollar sign on the slide. It's supposed to be a percentage, but whatever, sorry. <laughs> um, and that sets interim milestones for clean energy adoption and invests heavily in New Mexico's communities to ensure that a just and equitable transition to clean energy um, is present. Next slide. And then more places where it's already happening, um, these are specific cities rather than states. So in Pittsburgh, they have the Clean Rivers Campaign, which pushes green infrastructure projects to create jobs and drastically reduce flooding in frontline communities. Um, and then in Washington, DC, there's the Clean Energy DC Omnibus Act of 2018, which requires DC to transition to 100% renewable electricity sources by 2032, and it increases building performance standards. Um, which basically means that building standards are, you're going to have to be more energy efficient in your buildings, um, as well as having buses and large private vehicle fleets transition to elect electric sources. Um, Atlanta, Georgia has a 100% clean energy plan as well. Um, they want 100% clean renewable energy by 2035 across the city. Um, that is sourced locally um, in order to increase job availability and decrease energy costs. And then lastly, lovely Columbia, Missouri, um, in 2019, they enacted a climate action and adaptation plan, which lays out strategies and specific actions that we can take as a city across six different sectors to address risks posed by climate change and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, those sectors are energy, transportation, health, safety, and well-being, waste, housing, building, and development, and natural resources. Next slide. So that was all the information that we had for you. I know it was a lot, so we would love to answer any questions or just kind of partake in discussion about the things that we discussed. Um, we'd love to hear from you guys. I'm gonna take us off of the share screen just so we can see each other's faces while okay. we talk. Okay, cool. And then, or I guess before we discuss, we can talk about what we are doing or going over next week. Nikki, did yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, if you don't mind sharing your screen sure. really quickly. I have one slide just kind of talking about that. <laughs> okay. Hold Sorry. On. No, no, you're fine. Okay. Don't apologize. Okay. Is it sharing? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, so next week, um, we we're gonna be meeting this time next week, so 7 to 8 30 on next Wednesday, March 24th. And we're gonna be talking about ways that um people can advocate from home at the local, state, and federal level. Um, and we'll also be talking about um, international advocacy as well, just because that was brought up a bit last week. Um, and we do have a Facebook page, which I will put in the chat right now. It just gives a little synopsis of what our classes are all about and also provides the Zoom link to this course. Um, so go ahead and check that out, invite your friends. We would really appreciate it. Um, yeah, last week we challenged you all to bring one friend. Um, if you didn't, that's okay, but we just challenge you to bring a friend next week. Um, that way we can get the word out more about environmental advocacy and the importance of it. So, yeah. Cool. Any See, questions, um, comments, concerns, or compliments? <laughs> What's up, Max? <laughs> that was a great presentation. I have <clears throat> needing to learn more, a lot more about the Green New Deal and really, really appreciate this. Uh, I, I didn't know about the class last week, so I'm glad I joined a little late this week. Uh, my question is, in lot, and this may, it sounds like this is something you're gonna address next week, and so if, if you wanna wait. But I'm just uh, thinking in terms of lobbying Congress uh, for uh, getting this moving, is there a policy, is there a, resolution or or is it um what do we ask a congressman to do to enact the green new deal and if this sounds like you're going to address this next week so i can wait 
No, that's a good question. Um, I know at the federal level, um, I'm not too knowledgeable on what's specifically happening right now, but I know there's an infrastructure bill that kind of aligns quite a bit with Green New Deal policies and suggestions that is currently in the works in Congress. Um, and it also helps, I think, that the current Congress as of last election is a bit more progressive than what was in Congress previously. Um, so I think that kind of paves the way for a lot more progress when it comes to Green New Deal policies. Um, in Missouri specifically, I don't know where you're located, Max, but um, here in Missouri, the environment is a bit more hostile, uh, to say the least. Um, but, you know, there are bills in the works that are kind of trying to attack solar and net metering specifically, which kind of goes into um, credits that you get um, when you have solar. Um, so things are a little bit more behind here, but, you know, progress is being talked about. Mm -hmm. um, it just kind of depends on whether you're talking about federal advocacy and then state to state is also different as well when it comes to basically what their acceptance is of renewable energy and climate action. I don't mm -hmm. know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Yeah, and I think a, a big thing, um, which I made a note of to talk about next week is um, not just stopping your advocacy when like a plan like Max here in Columbia, like the climate action adaptation plan, like, yes, it was passed and that's great, but now we have to like pressure um, city council and our local leaders to actually do something about it. Columbia is pretty prone to making plans and getting super excited about it and then not doing anything. And, and so, um, and so we'll talk about how to actually like continually um, advocate for plans to actually to actually implement change and not just to pass those plans and then put it on the shelf in a binder and pat ourselves on the back for like a week. I had wanted to throw out a couple of things uh, real quick. First off, really good good stuff today and glad to hear it. And Thanks, Mark. Good. Uh, a couple of things I put in the chat two websites that might be useful for people who are concerned about fair taxes and uh, one is Citizens for Tax Justice and the other is uh, Americans for Tax Fairness I can't remember the exact names but they're in both sites are in the chat and uh, both are very useful I've found and actually Joe Biden's platform calls for some really good progressive tax changes, whether he's going to push for those or not, and what the chances of getting them through Congress, that's another question. But uh, it is something that he ran on and hopefully he'll be pursuing. Uh, the other thing I was going to mention as something to potentially put on calendars, uh, 350.org, or are people, I don't know if people are familiar with 350.org, but they are a national and international uh, movement, largely led by young people, but a mixture. Uh, Bill McKibben is one of the founding members of that group. They are holding a major uh, online uh, weekend conference. It's April 9th through 11th. And if you go to their Facebook page, 350.org, it's called the Global Just Recovery Gathering. And uh, they have, it's free and they have all kinds of excellent speakers. Uh, Naomi Klein's involved in organizing this. Bill McKibben will be there. A whole bunch of other people. Greta will be there. Uh, so it's, it's a real chance to see what a lot of people in the climate movement are moving toward and directions they would like to see us moving in. So I, I thought I'd put that out there. And the one other thing I was going to announce, and you all might have planned on announcing this at the end of the uh, program, but PeaceWorks is doing our annual sustainable living fair as a uh, set of online, uh, you know, uh, videos and discussions. And it starts, started yesterday and runs through this week and next week. So if you go to uh, either ColumbiaEarthDay.org, which is our Earth Day website, or if you go to the Facebook page for either PeaceWorks or uh, Center for Sustainable Living and look on the events, you can get the rundown of which events are happening when and get links to tune into them. 
and there is a YouTube channel for Columbia Earth Day that a lot of the workshops that have recorded will be on. So, so I just put that out there. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Mark. And also this week and next week's presentation is also part of the Sustainable Living Fair. So make sure you tell all your friends. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's a good mm -hmm. reminder. Real quick, I wanna just uh, express gratitude for you guys doing this and my friend Gerard for telling me about it. And uh, I was really pleased to hear, he, he brought me, so he did his job. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. I brought him, so I did my job. <laughs> the, the last time I was here, I, three weeks ago or two weeks ago, I sort of felt like an intruder. I didn't know what the deal was. But Michael said it's fine, so I came, and, and, and now I'm back. Um, and I, I rather hope you'll see more of me. I'm so inspired by what, by the way you're going about tackling such an immense. Mm -hmm. Unimaginable task. Um, I, I, I wrote it down. I see you doing what, what I want to be able to do. And the way I, I put it was instead of trying to do big things in service of a small goal. In other words, we'd all love to be um, Gandhi's and Martin Luther King's and Abraham Lincoln's, we're not going to do it. We're not going to make mm -hmm. it. At least I'm not, I'm 76. So <laughs> I think my window is passed. So I need to be satisfied with doing small things in service of the biggest imaginable goal. And showing up to support you guys in doing what you're doing, which I think is a small thing. There's 12 of us here, and I don't mean to, to minimize or belittle what you're doing, not at all. Um, uh, we are 12 people doing something about mm -hmm. a tremendous problem. And I have to learn how to take satisfaction from that rather than you know try to hit a home run every time. And I'm just not gonna do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have to say, um, the thing that that I do and I spend my time on on Zoom doing mostly is conducting critical thinking classes. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think to myself, there's no such thing as idle conversation. The conversations I've had with Michael led him to say, you know what, Steve, you should maybe come to this thing we do on Wednesday night. And so here I am. And that's as a result of idle conversation. So um, each of us in our way, we put a drop of ink in the water every time in the ocean, every time we open our mouths. And uh, that drop of ink, you know, might not think it's gonna have an impact. If it's there, you know it's there because you put it there. And if there are ways to test <laughs> for tiny, tiny, amounts of things in in vast you know bodies of water your ink is in there our ink is in there and i'm just going to keep dropping it so i thank you for being here and uh and thanks for listening thank you steve i appreciate yeah. you saying that yeah thank you yeah it's definitely the first step is i mean that's why i mean i don't want to speak for nikki but that's why we hold these classes is to yeah and informing people is the first step i guess so we appreciate you being here. Yes, Michael, I see your little hand. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I know it's on my feed, it says Gerard Exupery. That's just the, in case anybody was confused, probably not, but my name is Michael, but Gerard Exupery <laughs> is my uh, nom de plume uh, for my photography and stuff. So in any case, um, I, I put up in the uh, chat two links about uh, nuclear, these new nuclear um, energy plants that are very small. And, uh, you know, um, let me just read you something from uh, all right. uh, Small modular reactors or SMRs are the compact version of traditional nuclear fission reactors. Like their older brothers, SMRs use nuclear fission to generate carbon-free electricity. 
though on a much smaller scale than their uh, relatives, typically in the 50 megawatt to 400 megawatt range. And because of the new technology, the waste issue is greatly minimized. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, part of, uh, well, part of the article and, and other things that I've read, um, that if we don't do a lot quickly, we're, we're obviously going to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if one of these plants pulls one or two coal fire plants offline, you know, I think it's a, it's a reasonable risk. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to throw those links out there if anybody's interested. And, um, you know, I, I think uh, you have to be willing to keep your eyes open, you know, keep your yeah. blinds wide. <laughs> Yeah. No, I appreciate that, Michael. Also, is it called snake? The you sent one. The second one you sent says snake reactors. I can't tell if you're joking or if. Oh no no no! Oh, oh that's um. Oh wait a minute. It, um. Uh. No, that should be another article about the Bill Gates thing. Okay, they're actually called snake reactors. Got it. Oh. Okay. Um. Wait. One is an older article. The one of uh the Bill Gates article. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm no tremendous fan of Bill Gates or anything, but mm -hmm. um, there is a, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that there is this great interview you can find on YouTube uh, done by, um, what's his name? Cooper, for CNN. Um, Anderson. Anyway. Anderson Cooper. Anderson Cooper. Anderson Cooper. Yeah, that's him. <laughs> uh, for, um, for 60 Minutes. And, you know, it's about how, um, you know, he talks about climate change and, what people with all this money who, are, who can control all this money have to be doing in order to make um, achieving this goal a, a possibility. And he talks mm -hmm. about one section of it is these reactors. And, and I, it's very informative. And, um, you know, with the way technology is, things change every single day. You know, mm -hmm. it's incredible what new things um, are being developed and come online. And, um, you know, I don't, Obviously, technology is not going to fix everything, mm -hmm. but you know, I think that it's definitely a way towards it. So. Yeah. Can I, yeah. Can I throw out a couple of things, uh, not to be argumentative, but just to oh, uh, go ahead. Counter <laughs> counterpoint a little bit. Uh, basically, the nuclear industry has been saying since the 1960s that costs are going to come down through going to modular reactors. The Calway nuclear plant was part of a SNUPS program, standardized nuclear uh, unit power plants that was started in the early 1970s. And the idea was to make them so that they would be identical rather than each one being licensed individually. And this has been uh, a claim that the industry has made over and over again. First, they said, we'll achieve economies of scale by getting bigger. So we went from 300 megawatt to 600 megawatt to 1000 megawatt to 1200 megawatt reactors and we found we weren't getting economies of scale. So starting about 25 years ago, they started saying, we've got to mass produce small ones. And some people said build like five megawatt reactors to run a little city or a community. Others said to go to 50 or 200 or 300. But the bottom line is that this is a very, very costly technology. And you end up in a situation where when you're making a decision, whether you put your money into uh, renewables or put an efficiency or put it into nuclear, the big problem with nuclear is it's very expensive and very slow. Right now, they're trying to complete two reactors in Georgia at the Volcker plant. They've been under construction for uh, about 15 years now and are still way cost overrun and nowhere near done. And the problem you've got is the industry is always telling you the next new thing is going to be more cost effective, it's going to be more available quickly. But right now, if you started the licensing process for a new nuclear plant tomorrow, you wouldn't bring that plant online until after 2035 at the rate we're going. And we need to reduce our emissions by half by 2030, according to uh, the uh, top scientists in the world. The, uh, the situation is such that, you know, you, you're really making a choice. We're going to gamble on nuclear working or 
and being cost effective, or we're going to put it into something we know works. We know wind works, we know solar works, and we know the prices have come down. And the more we invest in them, the more we drive the prices down. And if we would invest in the uh, transmission lines to move large blocks of power energy efficiently through high voltage direct current transmission lines, we'd be able to move it from areas that are very windy and low density population like the Great Plains to the mi Midwest cities. And we could build offshore on the East and West coasts and get wind that's blowing almost constantly in those places and very cost effectively deal with our coastal cities. It's available, it's doable, and it's doable now. Nuclear is a big maybe. So even if you dismiss concerns over safety, waste, proliferation, uh, all of which I see as significant concerns, you still hit cost. And that's, that's the big uh, Achilles heel of this industry. I'll mention one other thing. Last week, the idea of a sodium cooled reactor was mentioned. And that's different than a new generation of fission reactors because they're what are called fast reactors uh, and they involve producing very large quantities of plutonium. Plutonium is one of the most dangerous substances we know of. One microgram, a millionth of a gram, if it was in somebody's lungs, would almost guarantee them lung cancer. And plutonium, about 12 pounds of plutonium makes a Nagasaki bomb. So it's a very dangerous material. On the sodium side, if you ever took a chemistry class in high school or college, you'll see uh, the professor or the teacher cutting a little piece of sodium off of something that's under uh, oil and bringing it out in the air and it burns spontaneously if it's in contact with air or water. And the idea of building reactors that use sodium as the coolant and uh, use that then going through a heat exchanger to heat water, to boil water, make steam to turn a turbine. It's not a very safe idea in my opinion. And they've tried it and they've had some serious problems including Detroit Edison, the company we were talking about a little earlier, uh, having some real problems with the Fermi reactor that was a sodium cooled reactor. So there are, there are more problems out there <laughs> than uh, make it a viable technology in my mind. What's up, Max? Uh, just real quickly, uh, one of the slides in an uh, earlier presentation, Erica, mm -hmm. <clears throat> had just, you know, really says it all, uh, that in every hour, we get enough energy from the sun mm -hmm. to provide the whole world's uh, energy needs for a year. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, found out just the other day, if if they took a 25, a 250 mile uh, area in Texas of just vast, you know, unused land and put solar collectors in that size uh, area, it would provide all of the energy for the United States. So there's renewable cheap <laughs> energy mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. And go ahead. <laughs> You guys don't have to raise your hands. It's okay. Um, <laughs> Just practice yeah. common courtesy is all. <laughs> I, I um, understand what was just said. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I also think though, if we are in the situation that we are in and it is necessary for us to do very rapidly in order to save our planet, I think it is wrong to paint with such a broad uh, stroke uh, what happened, you know, as in the past and what is go available now and what's mm -hmm. going to happen. So yes, um, nuclear industry, not very nice, not very good. Um, I, uh, <laughs> when um, Three Mile Island happened, I was uh, working in a film laboratory and Babcock and Wilcox, the, uh, um, plant builder had all of their images stored with us. And when that happened, the very same week, guys came in in dark suits and removed every single negative from the files in the laboratory. So, um, you know, I understand that, but um, 
you know, it's like, it's hard to, what is the expression? Um, it's hard to remember that your intention was to drain the swamp when you're up to your ass in alligators. And I think if this is a, if it is a newer technology and it is cleaner technology and it can be supervised or whatever it takes, um, I, you know, it may be what's needed at, at least at this point. So, you know, I think it's wrong to just broadly say no. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you got to keep your eyes and ears open for what may um, may work and be what we need. So that's all. Yeah, I definitely think it's important to weigh all of the options and all of the alternatives to, um, you know, whole reliance, especially, you know, in a state like Missouri, where renewable energy is very widely unaccepted. Obviously we want to continue to promote that because it is the best option, but if yeah. we have to choose between, you know, coal reliance and nuclear energy reliance, you know, while nuclear energy isn't the best option, it is, you know, if it means that we can make some sort of progress, it is something to consider for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. Does anyone else have any comments or concerns or compliments, as Nikki would say? <laughs> you know, I got to tell you, it's like every night at about every time we do this at about seven o'clock, I go, oh, I'm so, you know, like I'm so tired or you know, mm -hmm. maybe I'll just put this one out. And, you know, and I get on and I find it just so fascinating, um, uh, you know, and thank you you know it's just thank you for making my wednesday evenings much more interesting than they normally are of course thank you michael for bringing up some some good points and and research and whatnot i appreciate it yeah and thank you all for coming because i know that uh yeah i've said this almost every time at at the classes on wednesdays but in a zoom world it's not fun to leave work and then get on yet another zoom call so i i I appreciate it. I'm sure Nikki does too, but yeah. It is pretty remarkable when you think about it though, you know, how from all, all over the country, we can come together to discuss something very important. Yeah. You know? So mm -hmm. I'm grateful for that. Yeah. Anyone have any questions or things they want to hear about next time that um, we might be covering, but just in case you want to talk about, you can make sure that we cover. Nothing. The tumbleweed is just rolling by. <laughs> I think we're all looking forward to next week because you are answering all the questions that we all have. And kind of looking more ahead. So next week, mm -hmm. like I said, we'll be talking about local state and federal advoca advocacy and touching a bit on international advocacy as well as tips for doing all of that from home. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth week, we will be talking about key organizations to follow to kind of aid in that advocacy. Mm -hmm. so, like, for example, I think we'll be talking about, you know, Sierra Club and the Missouri Local Science Engagement Network. Things These were, yeah. Um, I don't think there are any Mizzou students on here. Well, I guess besides Austin, uh, climate leaders at Mizzou. Mm -hmm. Sustain or, Mizzou will be there as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, there will be a lot of guest speakers at that one. So it should be a mm -hmm. good, good session. Yeah. Can we get a shout out from where everybody is from? Yeah, that would be great. We can do a little round. Um, I can start. I'm uh, currently located in Columbia, but I'm from St. Louis County, specifically the Baldwin, Manchester area. I'm uh, from Pennsylvania, but I'm currently with Nikki in Columbia, Missouri. I live in Columbia, Missouri. Come on. I live in Kennett Square, the mushroom capital of the world. <laughs> and it smells like it too. Yeah. And it I was just like, say that. <laughs> Where is that? Where? Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, where Longwood Gardens is. I used to uh, fly, and when I would fly to New Garden Airport to visit Leslie, I swear to God, you would be 15 miles, 20 miles out at about 6,000 feet, 
and you could smell the mushrooms. You knew you were going in the right direction. <laughs> it is the most distinct manure smell you've ever smelled in your entire life. <laughs> so are you from Pennsylvania, Gerald? Oh, Michael, yeah. Where, where are you okay. from? Oh, Michael, uh, Michael. Oh, I'm from, uh, I'm in New Jersey, about 11 miles from New York City. And I live right next door to him. He lives right next door. <laughs> okay. I have family in Morristown, New Jersey. That's oh, cool. nice. Austin? I am from Colorado, but I live here in Columbia. I'm a grad student at Mizzou. I live here in Columbia, Missouri and have uh, since 1971. So I guess I'm almost from here, but I actually grew up in New York. Oh, really? <laughs> City and Long Island and went to college at Stony Brook on Long Island. So cool. Way back when we were still, you know, carving words in rocks rather than <laughs> paper. <and pens. laughs> when I went to graduate school, we used punch cards rather than keyboards and <laughs> yeah. stuff into computers. Yeah. How, how many of you know what do not fold, spindle, or mutilate? means or comes from punch cards. No. Punch cards. Do not fold, spindle, or mutilate. <laughs> Did we hear for Laura's from Laura? Uh, I'm from Columbia too. Um, well, I'm from St. Louis, but I live in Columbia now. And uh, speaking of rocks, I'm here working on pricing rocks. <laughs> <laughs> we got 13 boxes of rocks today. Big, oh, heavy wow. boxes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you are at the Peace Duck. It looks so different. Uh, look at this cool. If you live wow. in a glass house, don't, uh, you know, don't mess with that. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> There's a lot of boxes behind you. Or there are a lot of boxes yeah. behind you. You can't even see them all. <laughs> I have to take every moment to be checking the box out yeah what are you doing with the rocks selling them oh. are they that good <laughs> they're crystals they're that good oh okay, okay. yeah they're crystals <laughs> Is that a cat? they're gems really if you want to talk Fine about marketing the them. <laughs> and that's my grand cat Yes, uh, yeah. the noisiest cat of all of the cats <laughs> from Miami, uh, Florida. I love him so much. <laughs> from Miami, Florida. <laughs> I really appreciate this. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to have to leave. No worries. Uh, Thanks, Max. See you next week. Thanks for coming. See you next week. Same here. Thank you. Bye, Steve. Steve. Thank you. Bye, Steve. Alrighty. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, does anyone else have anything they want to talk about or discuss or? What have you? Nope. I, I'll mention one thing. Oh, were you going, Laura? I was going, but I'll, Go I'll listen to you <laughs> if you want. Is it something well, I already know? No, it's probably not. Uh, I posted an article or a, a link to a letter that uh, our Attorney General, Eric Schmidt, uh, had sent out as a fundraising letter and it maligns the Green New Deal and uh, Biden and his climate actions. And I posted it to the discussion of the event on Facebook, but when I went to look for it a few minutes ago, it wasn't there. And I realized it needed moderator approval, so I approved it since I can you change my moderator. hat and become a moderator. But <laughs> there also was something that uh, you posted, Erica, which was the uh, recording of last week's uh, class. Mm -hmm. And that also was not visible because it was a huh. approval. So I approved both of them. And I'd invite people to check out that article because I think it says a lot about the politics of what we're facing. Yeah. What our opposition is saying. And it's, it's, it's short. I mean, it's not really even an article. It's a letter to the editor that I responded to uh, on Facebook and posted it on Facebook. So you get a chance to check it out. Did you post a link? Yes. Put a link in chat? Yes, if you go to the discussion on the event. He was, he was asking if you could post it in the chat. Oh, can I post it in the chat? I, uh, I can post a link to the event in the chat and that 
will get you to the, if you just go to discussion, you should be able to get there. Give me a second and I will do that. I think you can see it whether or not you, I don't know if you have Facebook, Michael, but I think you should be able to see it either way. Yeah. If you don't have Facebook, you might not be able to see it. I don't know, but we'll give it a shot. Hey, I'm not uh, on the <laughs> okay. Feel free to check that out and see if it takes you there. And Thank Laura, you. I'm sorry that I spoke over you. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, I'm just here working out. Just, just carry on. <laughs> <laughs> was there something you wanted to say? No, I was going to say I was going to leave. <laughs> um, but I mean, I'll listen to you out of the corner of my ear. <laughs> No worries. <laughs> I thought it was interesting how Joe Biden uh, last week uh, came out with such a firm speech supporting the unionizing of the, um, without really saying it about in Alabama about the Amazon warehouses, how pro-union mm -hmm. he is. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I, I think he's probably better on the climate than the last guy. So, um, yeah. Yeah, anything could be better than previous to January, I think. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Which is sad, but good. Yeah. Hey. Gotta move forward. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to bid you all good night and uh, okay. see if I can find my dinner. Yeah. <laughs> good week, everyone. See you Thanks, next Mark. Week. See ya. Bye bye. Thank you. All righty. Well, I guess we will close this out, but yeah, we'll see you uh, next Wednesday at seven central time. Bye. Eight, Eight Eastern time. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Thank Laura. you, Nikki. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Okay. <laughs>